A large group of ornithopods walk along the fringe of a forest, eating the leaves off the trees and any other greenery they can seize in their beaks. They pass by a giant with a long neck feeding from the treetops. This is a relic from the old world. They remain, but their numbers shrink with every harsh winter. On the lookout for predators, the ornithopods move on. The adults keep the little ones close, the marks of previous battles visible on their scale-covered hides. These dinosaurs do not run from their carnivorous neighbours like their small ancestors. And though they have no armour, no horns, no tail spikes, they are far from defenceless. Welcome to this dinosaur profile on Iguanodon, one of the first dinosaurs named and a member of an enormously successful group that spread to every continent. The history of Iguanodon, its discovery and scientific study, covers most of the history of dinosaur research, and it can be used as a barometer, tracking the changing view of dinosaurs from when they were first described. So this history section is going to be long. If you want to skip ahead to the animal itself, you can go here. For everyone else, let's dive in. There were many colourful characters in science in the 19th century, many of which we will meet. But if we are talking about Iguandon, we have to start with Gideon Mantell. A little backstory. Gideon was born in Lewis in 1790, the fifth son of Methodist parents. This mattered as the Anglican Church was a major force in Britain at the time, and the local schools gave preference to Anglican children. Fortunately, Gideon's father Thomas knew a woman down the street who ran a dame school, a form of charitable learning where Gideon was taught basic maths and how to read and write. He then went away for further education with family members and friends of his father. He returned to Lewis at 15 and, without formal education, became the apprentice of a surgeon, James Moore. Mantell studied hard, learning from his mentor, and gained a diploma as a member of the Royal College of Surgeons and a certificate allowing him to perform midwifery duties in 1811, six years after starting his apprenticeship. He then partnered with Moore and kept up a phenomenal pace of work. This propelled the practice from earning around £750 a year by today's standards to over £700,000 a year. Throughout, Mantell had a keen interest in geology and fossils, often visiting local quarries to see what he could find or purchase from the workers. He sent some of his finds to the naturalist James Sowerby, who was impressed enough to induct Mantell into the Linnaean Society of London in 1813, the first society dedicated to natural history. In 1816, Mantell married Mary Ann Woodhouse, the daughter of a former patient, set up his own practice, and in 1819 began writing a book on the fossils he was collecting from Whiteman's Green Quarry, including some teeth that looked reptilian and oddly herbivorous. The events of the discovery of the first tooth that would define Iguandon are legend. It's said that Mantel's wife found them among quarry rocks, travelling with her husband to visit a patient. Later Gideon said that he had found the tooth, and there is no evidence that Mary Ann visited patients with him. Whether the story is true or not, the first clearly identifiable herbivorous dinosaur tooth was found in 1822. Mantell had published his first book, The Fossils of the South Downs, and was invited to a get-together of the Royal Society of London, the foremost scientific institution in Britain. Mantell took along his fossilised teeth and met with William Buckland, a prominent geologist and expert in fossils. He thought that the teeth looked like those of a fish or a rhinoceros, but suggested that they could be sent to Georges Cuvier. So Mantell handed them over to the Scottish geologist Charles Lyell, who would be meeting with Cuvier. Georges Cuvier was a giant in 19th century scientific circles. His knowledge of animals and ability to identify them was considered absolute. At a Parisian soiree over Champagne, Lyle showed the mysterious teeth to Cuvier, who declared them the teeth of a rhinoceros. The next morning, presumably after the hangover had cleared, Lyle sent a letter to Mantel to tell him the news. But Mantel was not deterred. In 1824, Buckland fully described a massive carnivorous reptile that he had named Megalosaurus. He visited Mantell to look at his fossil collection 
and said that the teeth were definitely reptilian, and, feeling invigorated, Mantel decided to resend them to Cuvier. His response was surprising. Cuvier remembered being shown the teeth, but was quite drunk when he made the identification. In the morning he told Lyle that he had made a mistake, but Lyle neglected to tell Mantel this. Cuvier wrote, well, here is a translation. These teeth are certainly unknown to me. They are not from a carnivorous animal, and yet I believe that they belong to the order of reptiles. Do we not have here a new animal, a herbivorous reptile? He also advised Mantel that there should be searches for more complete skeletons of this animal, with le plus de perseverance, or the greatest perseverance. With Cuvier legitimising the identification, Mantel could push on. After searching through the records of the Royal College of Surgeons with the help of a Mr. Clift, Mantel found that the teeth looked like those of an iguana, but far larger. He thought about naming the creature Iguanosaurus, but his friend, William Daniel Conybert, thought that that name would be better for the iguana itself, and suggested another. So in 1824, Mantel announced the name of a new prehistoric herbivorous reptile to the Portsmouth Philosophical Society, Iguanodon meaning iguana tooth. This was cemented in 1825 when he presented his findings to the Royal Society of London. He later followed this up with the description of another herbivorous reptile that would also later be classified as a dinosaur, Hylaeosaurus. Unfortunately, Mantell's practice was suffering and he moved to Brighton in 1833. He, his wife and two children would have been destitute if the local council had not agreed to fund him to turn his collection into a museum. Still collecting fossils from quarries, Mantell bought a slab from Maidstone in Kent that was full of disarticulated bones and the impressions of some very familiar teeth. This block, often referred to as Gideon's mantelpiece, allowed him, with a few other bits and pieces, to make the first sketch of Iguandon, rather infamously placing a pointed, horn-looking bone on the creature's nose. This was probably inspired by the short nose spikes on some iguanas. This drew the attention of a professor in the Royal College of Surgeons who had made his name as a gifted anatomist and had numerous society connections, Richard Owen. Owen had quickly risen in the scientific community due to his abilities of identification and through the connections of his mentors. When the naturalist Charles Darwin had returned on the Beagle in 1836 with some fossils, Charles Lyell sent them to Owen. They were identified as similar to the animals Darwin had seen on his travels solidifying Darwin's ideas on evolution. Ironically, Owen was a vicious opponent on the early ideas of evolution, using his clout at the Geological Society of London to ridicule anyone who supported it. In 1841, Darwin was ill, and Owen visited him. It seems that Owen was one of the figures that Darwin knew would be furious at the idea of evolution by natural selection, a fear that led him to sit on his origin of species until he had made every detail airtight. Owen was not idle, and in the same year he visited Darwin, he created the clade Dinosauria, encompassing Buckland's Megalosaurus and Mantell's Iguandon and Hyliosaurus. While a defining moment in paleontology, it was a massive power move by Owen. By publishing a comprehensive definition of the three dinosaur types that will be well circulated due to his clout at the Royal College of Surgeons and at the Royal Society, he could gain more credit than the more poorly published scientists who had initially made the discoveries. He would use this to actually steal the credit for the discovery of Bellum Knights from the amateur Channing Pierce, an act that would later get him ejected from the Royal Society's Zoological Council when it was uncovered. Mantell had by now lost the means to fight Owen. His museum had failed, and he was left to sell his collection to the British Museum, shortly after his wife left him, taking their son and daughter. Mantell was also left with severe spinal injuries that gave him a crooked appearance and caused him much pain. It's unclear what exactly happened, but some accounts tell of the carriage accident. He began taking opium as a painkiller in 1845, as the suffering had become constant, but he continued to work on fossils. Looking at his records of Iguandon, he realised that it was a slimmer animal than he had thought, but this was not recognised by the Royal Society. Owen made another show of clout. He published a widely circulated description of Iguandon, the Maidstone specimen already being referred to as Iguandon Mantelli that eclipsed Mantell's descriptions of 1835 and 1841. Many more people would later refer to this, giving Owen the credit. 
It also utilizes elephantine reconstructions of Iguandon and other dinosaurs, as an example of mammalian and reptilian features present in the same animal, and argue against evolution. He proposed that this was the variety of God's creation built upon a vertebrate foundational divine idea that he called the archetype, believing, incorrectly, that an upright stance and sturdy limb bones were mammalian features. In the 1850s, the Victorian Great Exhibition was closing up, and a new location was being eyed in Hyde Park to erect a permanent Crystal Palace, as opposed to the temporary one used for the exhibition. New grounds and a park would be constructed around it, which would include full-size models of long-extinct creatures. Organisers wanted Mantell to design the dinosaurs, having discovered two of the three types, and probably bringing his revised views to the drawing board. Unfortunately, Mantell was in worse health than ever, and so Owen was made responsible for the designs. The park would include two Iguandon models, one of which was used to hold a banquet for 20 inside it on New Year's Eve 1853 with the sculptor Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins presiding, and Owen at the head of the table. The park would admit the public in 1854, with the new Crystal Palace grand opening, but Mantell would never see it. He died of an opium overdose shortly after the models were commissioned. A post-mortem revealed that he had been suffering from severe scoliosis. His spine was removed and preserved in the collection of the Royal College of Surgeons, overseen by its then conservator, none other than Richard Owen. He was made superintendent of the Natural History Departments of the British Museum in 1856, which housed Mantell's collection of rocks and fossils. But then an earthquake rocked the scientific community by the publishing of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859. This, and the concurrent work by Alfred Russell Wallace, created a rift in the scientific community by providing an explanation of the transmutation of species, as it was then called. Many still held to the idea that species were fixed, and while some went extinct, they were created by God and did not change. This view may have been reinforced by most science professors in prestigious British universities having to be ordained into the Anglican Church to hold those positions. Owen was furious. Although he held his specific personal beliefs close to his chest, he let everyone know what he hated, and he hated evolution by natural selection having numerous heated debates with Thomas Henry Huxley, who would later be referred to as Darwin's bulldog for his vicious defence of Darwin's ideas. While many remarked that Owen's great irritation was that more people in London were talking about Darwin than him, he was not a man to let an opportunity go to waste. He had long felt constrained by the confines of the British Museum, and wanted a separate museum for the Natural History Collection. He told a parliamentary committee, The whole intellectual world this year has been excited by a book on the origin of species, and what is the consequence? Visitors come to the British Museum and they say, let us see all these varieties of pigeons, where's the tumbler, where's the powder, and I am obliged with shame to say, I can show you none of them. As to showing you the varieties of those species, or of any of those phenomena that would aid one in getting at that mystery of mysteries, the origin of species, Our space does not permit, but surely there ought to be a space somewhere, and if not in the British Museum, where is it to be obtained? Land was bought in South Kensington, right next to the Science Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1864, and building was completed in 1880. I have not held off on my opinion of Owen in this, but I cannot deny that the Natural History Museum in London is one of my favourite buildings in the world. Owen was a seriously unlikable person, so when the tide turned on him he had no students, no protégés, no real friends to support him. He was brought down by a combination of things. The aforementioned plagiarism, the refusal to defend his own views on the origin of species, as that would need him to define his own position, and the growing division over his Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Although the scientific community was moving away from those depictions when they were being created, great strides had been made since, when the Crystal Palace burned down in 1936, it was once spoken of by Thackeray as a blazing arch of lucid glass, and that description was never truer than tonight. The park was all that was left, and the public began making the models a butt of jokes. Oh boy, don't ever do that on a dark night. After the Maidstone specimen, the next major iguanodon find came from the Isle of Wight in 1849. For some reason, the block containing an articulated back, hip, and most of a leg was split in two one part being sold to the naturalist, James Scott Bowerbank, and the other to Mantell. Mantell, however, never described the specimen. After he died, the British Museum acquired it and purchased the other piece from Bowerbank. 
It was examined by Owen in 1855, who described it as a juvenile iguandon. Not everyone was convinced, but there were only three dinosaurs and one ornithopod for comparison at the time. In 1868, an Isle of Wight amateur paleontologist, William Fox, was looking at the site of the Mantel Bower Bank block and found a skull that was the right size to have come from the skeleton. He had read about Owen's description, but could tell that this small skull was that of an adult, not a juvenile. He informally presented it as Iguanodon foxii, a small species of Iguanodon, which Owen offered to publish. Owen's debate rival, Thomas Huxley, described the skull himself in 1870, and noted that there were two types of teeth in the jaw, and that neither were similar to Iguanodon. He had been critical of Owen's I. foxii designation, and decided that a new genus should be created for this dinosaur, Hypsilophodon foxii. Whether the new dinosaur was a new species of Iguanodon or a new genus caused a bit of a rift. The geologist John Whitaker Hulk, Hulk with an E, weighed in with the paleontologist Harry Seeley in 1873 on the side of Hypsilophodon, noting even more differences with Iguanodon. Owen stuck to his guns though and doubled down on his Iguanodon identification in 1874. While this was going on, some new fossil bones were being examined by Oxford University Professor Joseph Prestwich. He identified it as a new species of Iguanodon in 1879, but got help from Hulk. Being in the thick of the Iguanodon controversy, Hulk wanted people to know the scientific rigour of his work, even if they just read the title, resulting in this. Naming his new species Iguanodon Prestwichii. It had the effect of winning over Owen, but not Seeley. With Owen on side, Hulk thought that he could tie off the whole Hypsilophodon issue in 1882, with a full osteology of the fossil bones. But Owen still wasn't buying it. It took Henry Woodward's work in 1885, referring to the American discoveries of Nanosaurus, the now dubious Laosaurus, and especially Camptosaurus, to end the debate. Seeley did not agree with I. Pressed Witchy Eye, and in 1888 proposed a new generic name, Cumnoria. This was when Richard Lydecker weighed in. He did not see the need for a new genus and proposed the specimen be classed as Iguanodon until 1889 when he accepted too many differences and proposed it be moved to the previously described Camptosaurus genus instead. This set up the ideological difference between the two. The issue about what Iguanodon looked like was still elusive. It was universally agreed that the Crystal Palace dinosaurs had it wrong, but the new fossils were still bits and pieces. The skull of Hypsilophodon showed how different an ornithopod could be, but there was still no solid idea of what the dinosaur actually looked like, until a Belgian team of miners found some fossils 322 metres below the village of Bernissart. While digging for coal in the Santa Barb mine, the workers came across a clay pocket. They carried on through and found what appeared to be tree trunks dotted with gold. The gold was actually pyrite, fool's gold, and the tree trunks were bones. Alphonse Briard and Louis de Poul guided the excavations, making detailed records of how the fossils were found. They were dug out in large blocks to be carefully extracted later, but with the positions of the blocks catalogued so the skeletons could be reassembled. Little was known about the preservation of fossils, and these bones were suffering from pyrite disease. Pyrite had formed inside the fossils, which was fine when they were sealed away in clay. When they interacted with the air, the pyrite reacted with the oxygen, called pyritization, expanding and causing the fossils to crumble. De Poe had to think on his feet and wrap the blocks in paper and plaster, reinforced by iron rings. 130 tons of fossils were carted to Brussels. When the bones were excavated, all visible pyrite was removed and they were dipped in vats of boiling hot glues. By 1882, more than 38 individuals were identified. Nine were judged to be suitable for display, were fully excavated and mounted. This process in the 19th century was not kind on the fossils. The bones were held in place by adjustable ropes to get the position just right. Holes were then drilled for the metal scaffolding going through the bones and being screwed in place. The nine mounted skeletons were set up in the Royal Museum of Natural History in Brussels in 1891. From 1902 they were set up in the Royal Museum's new premises. In 1914 the German invasion left the mine on the occupied side. Despite the war, Berlin sent Otto Jockel to oversee the reopening of the mine for further fossil excavation. No fossils were recovered as the German army surrendered and withdrew in 1918, before a fossiliferous layer was uncovered. The mine flooded in 1921 that prevented any further work. 
Unsurprisingly, the number done to the fossil bones and the 30 years of being exposed to the open air were causing some to crumble. The humidity in the air and the water that was unintentionally retained in the fossils by their treatment was continuing the piratisation. The fossils were urgently taken down by the Royal Museum of Natural History director Victor von Stralen in 1933, and a thorough restoration project undertaken that was completed in 1937. Alcohol was used to infiltrate the fossils and remove any moisture. Arsenic was then added to kill off any mould, and a large amount of shellac used to harden the fossils. It's this shellac treatment that turned the fossils a dark brown, as that is not their natural colour, and they were kept behind glass where the temperature and humidity could be controlled. They were again dismantled and moved to the basement in 1940 for fear of bombings, but when they were remounted, it was clear that they were too delicate to be moved again. Finally, in 2003 to 2007, much of the shellac was removed and replaced with modern epoxy glues that are kinder to fossils. These days, fossils like this would be excavated in climate-controlled laboratories, and chemicals like polyethylene glycol used to remove the moisture and strengthen their internal structure. Louis Dolo, who was in charge of the posture of the skeletons, thought that Iguandon was very different from the elephant-like animals of Richard Owen. Dolo concluded that it was a biped, moving round on just its hind legs. He came to this conclusion by examining the spine, which he found similar to modern bipeds, and from the fossil footprints found in the UK. It is difficult to ascertain now whether he was mistaking theropod or small ornithopod tracks for iguanodon footprints. The bird-like hips, legs, head and chest had him looking at flightless birds over half a century before the dinosaur renaissance. To get the upright posture that he thought was indicated by the bones, he also looked at the wallaby. Owen had kept Iguandon spike as a horn from Mantell's reconstruction, having no idea where else it would go, but the mostly articulated Bernisart skeletons showed that the spike was a modified thumb on a very complex hand. In the days when paleontologists were still trying to figure out which bones fit where, the Bernisart finds were incredible. Whole skeletons could be reconstructed as they would have been in life. Examination of the teeth and bones that could be compared with the Maidstone slab identified one skeleton as Iguandon Mantelli. The other skeletons were bigger and more robust, and were named Iguandon Bernisartensis. There being so many articulated skeletons, many almost 100% complete, I. Bernisartensis quickly became the basis of subsequent Iguandon identifications, and heavily influenced the debates between Lydecker and Seeley. In modern paleontological parlance, Lydecker would be called a lumper, and Seeley would be called a splitter. Lydecker used existing genera where possible, attributing differences to species. In 1888-1889 he named I. dorsoni, I. fitoni, and I. hollingtoniensis. Lydecker thought that if you kept creating new genera you were complicating the issue. Seeley preferred using genus as a more exact gauge for differentiation. He was particularly cautious about the overuse of iguanodon, thinking that if you used it too often, the genera was in danger of becoming meaningless. Seeley's concerns were not without merit. Since Mantel's iguanodon teeth were given the species name Anglicus by German paleontologist Friedrich Holl, many other species had popped up. There was a find in Germany that was named I. Mantelli by Christian Erich Hermann von Meyer in 1932. These fragments were judged to be from the same species as the later Maidstone slab, giving its name over and being used as the most complete iguanodon reference until the Bernisart finds. Then there was I. Philipsi, described by Seeley, but later reassigned to a Thyria foreign he named Priodontognathus. I. Suizii was found in Austria, and Owen described a jaw as I. Hoggy. I. Precursor was described in France, but it was quickly realised that it was actually a piece of sauropod. I. Exogyrarum was uncovered in an area that is now the Czech Republic, and we have already seen what happened with Iguandon Prestwitchii becoming Camptosaurus Prestwitchii. We then get Iguandon bernisartensis become the unofficial reference for Iguanodon. Hulk found some fossil remains that he named I. Seelii, not after the paleontologist Harry Seely, but Charles Seely, owner of the estate on the Isle of Wight where the fossil was found. Lydecker then added his I. dorsoni, I. fitoni, and I. hollingtoniensis to this considerable list. And he wasn't done. In 1888, Lydecker wrote Catalogue of the Fossil Reptilia and Amphibia in the British Museum Natural History, where he outlined his loose definitions on Iguanodon. This was later incorporated into a Catalogue of British Fossil Vertebrata in 1890, 
which would lead to numerous subsequent fines being assigned to Iguanodon. You had I. Hilly in 1892 from the Upper Cretaceous of Hertfordshire, the youngest Iguanodon species described, and I. Albinus, another Czech Iguanodon in 1893. Ernst van der Broek renamed Hulk's Vectisaurus valdensis as Iguandon valdensis in 1900. Amateur paleontologist R. W. Hooley described I. Arthurfieldensis on the Isle of Wight, while in Mongolia, Russian A. K. Rozdevensky described I. orientalis based on fragments and a very distinctive skull. Two finds of Streptospondylus, one found by Owen and one by Lidecker, were renamed as I. major and I. gracilis in the 1960s. With 17 species, Iguandon was fast becoming a waste bucket genus. Find a vaguely hadrosauroid fossil, then call it Iguandon something or other, and get on with your day. By the mid 20th century, more care was being taken, but undefined Iguandon SP finds were still turning up with depressing regularity. The discovery of Dinicus and the start of the dinosaur renaissance did not much affect the lizard wallaby perception of Iguandon. There had been a few revelations regarding the feeding of hadrosaurs and iguandontids, but leaps and bounds were made when David Norman began studying them in 1980. David Norman is a Cambridge professor, curator of vertebrate paleontology, and the expert on iguanodon. He wrote an exhaustive report on the specimens of iguandon burn sartensis and mantelli, and concluded a new posture. The tails have ossified tendons, which would have made the tails stiff and straight. In fact, to get the wallaby pose of the Bernisart mounts, the tails had to be broken. Norman reconstructed the straight tail and noted that it would bring the back and arms down. In this pose, it would be easier for large iguandon to plant their hands and walk on all fours, occasionally rearing or running on their hind legs. Iguanodon's century-old pose had just been overturned. In response, the Bernisart Museum constructed a set of casts in the quadrupedal posture. The original's now too delicate to move. And that was not the only conclusion from that report. I'll be bringing up a lot of points from it later in the biology portion. There is a link in the description, and it is a must-read for lovers of Iguanodon. Later in 1986, Norman took another look at the small Iguanodon from Bernisart. Norman found more likenesses with the more complete Isle of Wight specimen I. Arthurfieldensis, and so had the Bernisart finds reclassified. He also folded the dubious Isle of Wight I. gracilis into this as well, finding no significant difference. This left the Maidstone specimen the only I. mantelli, and changed the reference of the smaller, slender Iguandon to I. arthurfieldensis. With people like David Norman on the watch, and more hadrosauriforms being found, the descriptions of new Iguandon species dipped, but did not disappear. There was Iguandon lakotaensis in 1989, becoming the first North American Iguanodon. There was also Iguandon mongoliensis in 1992, although that was only from a misprinted caption of a photo in A Children's Guide to Dinosaurs and Other Prehistoric Animals that was firmly expunged and given a proper name in 2005. In the 90s, Norman went after this overabundance of Iguandon species. He folded I. valdensis into I. arthurfieldensis and I. orientalis into a new genus, Altirhinus. The fossil in the misprinted caption would be given this name too. He sided with Seeley in thinking that the pressed witchii species was neither Iguandon nor Camptosaurus, but belonged to the new genus Seeley created, Cumnoria. Norman also weighed into the discussion on the American Isla Cotaensis, which some were taking to call Dakotodon, saying that it was within the range of individual variation of I. Bernis Artensis. In 2000, the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature formalised what had been going on for over a century changing the type species of Iguandon from the mess of bones in the Maidstone specimen to the more complete Bernisart finds, from Mantelli to Bernisartensis. In 2004, two other species were phased out. Norman reassigned Isusii to the Iguandontian genus Muclodon, originally created by Seeley in 1871. I. Hilly was redescribed as a hadrosaurid and later in 2014 as a hadrosauroid restricting Iguandon to the early Cretaceous. What turned out to be a massive shift came in 2007 when Gregory S. Paul, Frankensteiner of Velociraptor and creator of Giraffe of Titan, decided to get into Iguanodon. He thought that the differences in I. arthurfieldensis were too great from I. bernisartensis and created a new genus, Mantellisaurus arthurfieldensis. 
Despite some of the things you're going to hear about Paul's work, this classification has held up to scrutiny. He did not think that all I. Arthur Fieldensis specimens were Mantellisaurus, and called the slender Bernis art finds Dolodon Bampingi in 2008. Carpenter and Yoshida thought this similar to I. Celii, and created Dolodon Celii. This was around the time that I. Major was generally agreed to be a dubious species and considered some sort of undefinable iguanodon. In 2009, I. Hoggy was renamed as Owinodon Hoggy, not by Paul, but by American paleontologist Peter Galton. In 2010, Carpenter and Ishida published the results of their study on the iguanodontids of the Cedar Mountain Formation, a near unbroken sequence of about 35 million years. They thought that this could be used as a basis of expected iguanodontid diversity over time. Norman had been arguing for four species of iguanodontid being present in the Wealdon group in the south of England, but the Cedar Mountain data indicated to Carpenter and Ishida that there should have been more. Paul jumped on this reading and, with Carpenter and Ishida, began redefining the British iguanodontids into what they would expect to see in the 17 million year span of the Wealdon group. There are the specimens of Iguandon bernisartensis, Mantellisaurus arthafieldensis, Beryllium dorsoni, and Hypsalospinus, identified by Norman. They support the identification of most of these, apart from naming Beryllium dorsoni, Terillium dorsoni, and added a few. They include Vectisaurus valdensis, originally named by Hulk in 1879, and Phenospondylus gracilis from Lydecker in 1888. Also included is Cucufeldia tilgatensis from McDonald in 2010. Carpenter and Yoshida named Proplanicoxia galtoni, Celecoxia pauli, and Woodhurstia fitoni as part of their 2010 study. Paul chimed in in 2012, bringing with him the two Dolodon species. He thought assigning Lydecker's I. hollingtoniensis to Hypsellospinus was a mistake, and created Huxleysaurus hollingtoniensis. Another find identified as Hypsellospinus, he identified as his Darwinsaurus evolutionis. He also went after the Maidstone specimen. It had been left as the only I. mantelli after the ICZN moved the Iguandon type to Bernis artensis, but Paul thought it deserved its own genus, calling it Mantelodon Carpenteri. And here come the quotes. Paul championed the work by Carpenter and Ishida assigning all of these genera to the Wealdon group. He wrote that as the group is hundreds of metres deep and formed over 20 million years, they should contain a long multiplicity of faunas, each with distinct and often diverse set of taxa. He took particular aim at Norman, saying that his Basic argument that there are just two European iguanodonts in the Valanginian, and then just two more in the next two stages up to the Eleaptian, is so simplistic in evolutionary terms that it must be rejected unless future discoveries actually do show that specimens from such long spans of time must be placed in so few taxa. David Norman is very good at his job, and did not seem to appreciate being called out. You also need to be very confident to try to correct someone about their home turf. Norman hit back with a shade-filled paper the likes of which I have rarely read. He pointed out that the Wealdon group is not one long continuous sequence, but two small sequences that appear in three locations. Norman wrote, The fact that this theoretical scenario does not apply in reality reflects in large measure the above author's unfamiliarity with the geology and paleontology of the area in question. Most easily dealt with were Vectisaurus, Sphenospondylus, and Proplanicoxia, all of which Norman had previously reviewed as dubious since 1986, and which MacDonald had assigned to Mantellisaurus in 2012. Terillion and Woodhurstia Norman had described as Brillium dorsoni and Hypsella spinus fitoni, respectively, months before Carpenter and Ishida came up with their interpretations, giving Norman priority. Cucufeldia and Celecoxia were also folded into beryllium. Cucufeldia because MacDonald, who had named it, realised later that he was mistaken, and Celecoxia because the pelvis used to describe it was incomplete and crushed, something that Carpenter and Ishida failed to notice. Dolodon celii was also criticised for its identification being based on overly simplified 2D outlines of the pelvis not drawn to scale and there was a quick reaffirmation that it was within the range of I. Bernis artensis. But Norman had worse for Paul. Dolodon Pampingi, Norman attested, was the result of changes of proportion in Paul's life restorations, that any difference was due to artistic interpretation 
and that the actual bones were identical to Mantellosaurus. Norman also lays out that Paul had no clue of the geology of the area when creating Huxisaurus based on features that aren't present in the specimen and had mixed several specimens together to create Darwinsaurus. Huxisaurus was assigned to Hypsellospinus and Darwinsaurus from one quarry to Hypsellospinus and from another to Mantellosaurus. Then there is the Maidstone Mantellodon. Paul's creation of the genus wrongly describes some features and mentions a few that are not preserved at all. It ends with Norman firmly assigning the Maidstone specimen to Mantellosaurus. Growing suspicious, Norman checked with a contact at the Natural History Museum where much of this material, including the Maidstone specimen, is kept. There was no indication that Paul had even set foot in the building. He writes, Although I risk appearing excessively judgmental, it is hard to avoid the conclusion that Paul is making unfounded taxonomic proposals based upon preconceptions alone. He says that apart from Mantellosaurus, all the taxonomic names that have been proposed for wield and ornithopod material by G.S. Paul, K. Carpenter and Y. Ashida have been revealed to be either objectively synonymous with existing taxa or founded upon misunderstandings, preconceived notions or inaccurate anatomy or various combinations of these factors. Norman cites the research being based on expectation rather than observation of the material that the Wilden might have seen a myriad of different ornithopods, but the brief windows we have do not show it, and that misguided logic like this is just the kind of thing that the peer review process should be able to prevent seeing print. One final note about this paper is that it finds a messy but effective way to handle Mantell's Iguanodontooth. You should keep the name Iguanodon Anglicus, as it is a special piece of paleontological history, but has no diagnostic features being pretty much identical to any iguanodontid tooth. Mantell kept hold of it, and on his death it went to his son Walter, also a fossil collector, who had moved to New Zealand. That is why the tooth is currently held in Wellington's Museum of New Zealand Te Papatongawera, although not on display. But, when it looked like there was only going to be Ibenis artensis, in 2015, Iguandon galvanensis was described from Teruel in Spain. This brings the up-to-date tally on Iguandon species to two, I. Bernis artensis and I. galvanensis, with I. anglicus having a reserved status. Assigning a new iguandon species in 2015 took some work as there has been a push against assigning random ornithopods to iguanodon, the reasons for which I hope I have made clear. Recent finds in Spain have named the early Cretaceous iguandontids Morelodon, also in 2015, Magnumanus in 2016, and Portelsaurus in 2021. An examination of a specimen assigned to Mantellosaurus revealed it to be a new species of Iguanodontid on the Isle of Wight, and was named Brystonius in 2021. These are the dinosaurs we have known about for the longest, and yet they are still able to surprise us. Be on the lookout, because the story of Iguanodon is far from over. Let's start talking about Iguanodon itself with size. This is going to be referencing the Bernisart specimens as they are mostly complete and show a deal of individual variation. It seems like the average length of an adult Iguanodon was about 10 metres long, with the largest reaching 11 metres. There are some indications and in odd bones that some adults may have reached 13 metres long. Iguanodon was a big animal in the early Cretaceous, but it was small compared to the sauropods, which were dominant in the Jurassic. The Jurassic was a stable hothouse, the climate was nice and warm for over 50 million years, perfect for large herbivores to establish themselves and become dominant in places like the Morrison Formation. The Cretaceous was different. While still being comparatively warm, the climate was a roller coaster. There are times when there was even ice at the North Pole, unusual in the Mesozoic, and one floor of growing big means that you are very susceptible to extinction. Large bodies need a lot of food just to keep going. Even a small decline in that food can be fatal. One thing that made sauropods unusual was their high birth rate for such a large animal. They were able to keep this up and diversify in the southern hemisphere and did cling on in the early Cretaceous in the north, but they were being supplanted. This was not by the Thyreophorans like Stegosaurus and the Ankylosaurs, but by the Ornithopods. One often overlooked natural selection pressure is food. With carnivores, this gets overshadowed by the teeth and claws necessary in them getting their meals. But herbivores regularly survive or go extinct based on how they gather and process plants. 
As I have stated in other videos, sauropods had long necks to increase their uptake, and huge bodies to let the vegetation ferment and have all the nutrients leached out. Ornithopods could not do this. There is no sign in the bones of any ornithischian dinosaur, stegosaurs, ankylosaurs, ceratopsians, pachycephalosaurs or ornithopods possessing an air sac breathing system. They used standard lungs just like mammals and reptiles. This meant that they could not breathe with an incredibly long neck. They could not use it to reduce energy foraging or disperse heat from a huge body. Without sauropod sized bodies, they could not use huge fermentation guts to extract nutrients. They needed another way to break up the plants that they ate. Ornithopods, and particularly hadrosauriforms like Iguanodon, had to get innovative. They had keratin covered beaks on the front of their jaws. Signs on the underlying bones indicate that the front of these were serrated and scraped against each other when the mouth closed. This provided a cutting ability and the edge would be self sharpening with the beak constantly growing. While the front was sharp, the corners seemed blunt, able to crush and pull. This allowed Iguandon to deal with many different kinds of vegetation. I've said before that archosaurs don't chew. Birds and reptiles have simple hinges in their jaw. Mammals have a complex hinge with lots of different muscles allowing us to rotate our jaws and grind the teeth together to break down food. Archosaurs can only move the jaw up and down, having to swallow whole anything they can bite off. The ornithopods found a way around that. Iguandon's famous tooth was one in a battery that lined the outside of the lower jaw and the inside of the upper jaw. As the jaw moved up and down, the teeth would scrape against each other. The skull even had a hinge so that the upper teeth batteries could move, making sure that the teeth were always pressed against each other, grinding and effectively chewing the food into smaller pieces that could be digested more easily and more efficiently. There would also have been fleshy cheeks to keep the food inside the mouth. Mantell tentatively proposed a prehensile tongue based on the front parts of the skull appearing spout-like. Dolo took this further in 1923 by proposing that Iguandon had a long tongue like that of a giraffe. This was popular until the 1960s when re-examination confirmed the beak, and that Dolo's spout reconstruction was based primarily on a damaged skull. While the muscle attachments show a strong muscular tongue, it was probably just used to move food around inside the mouth. The beak was more than capable of collecting food. Scans from hadrosaur mummies, I'll talk more about these in a bit, also reveal a crop. In birds this is a kind of pouch below the esophagus, used for storing food. It allows birds to swallow huge amounts of food in one sitting and digest it at their leisure. It's handy if you don't know when your next meal is going to be. As Iguandon is about as far from birds on the dinosaur tree as it is possible to be, this could have been an early feature of dinosaurs or could simply have evolved independently. Some invertebrates have evolved crops themselves. Similar solutions to similar problems. The two hadrosaur mummies are called Leonardo and Dakota. They are both Edmontosaurus, which are late Cretaceous hadrosaurs and more developed than Iguandon, but looking at them can provide some insights. All ornithopods seem to have been scaly. Numerous skin impressions show a mosaic of scales, but Leonardo and Dakota actually have skin preserved and show the variation. They had large scales on their back, getting smaller and further apart to a smooth belly, and the toughest scaling being around the hands and feet for protection from undergrowth. One of the most intriguing is the arrangement of scales along the back. Some have noted that the scales seem to form a pattern. If the scales were individual colours, this might have produced stripes. Most coloured designs of dinosaurs are pure imagination, but this evidence of stripes on ornithopods and in feathered theropods is why I include stripes in most of my dinosaur designs. While Iguandontids had their backs mostly horizontal, the majority of their weight was centred over the hips. In smaller Mantellisaurus, Norman theorised that they may have been more bipedal, counterbalancing their body with a muscular tail. It seems that young Iguandon was similar, having relatively short arms that lengthened as the body got heavier and it walked on all fours more often. In fact, it's known that some Iguandon, at least, were normally quadrupeds because we have tracks. Again, we don't know exactly what dinosaurs left these as there's not a skeleton at the end, but that has not stopped these clear ornithopod tracks being called Iguanodon. Just as animal fossils have genera, Ichnofossils, things like burrows and footprints, have Ichnogenera, and Iguanodon is a name for both. While walking on all fours, large Iguanodon would probably have still reared up to feed or run. 
While it has been assumed for a long time that these animals would have been able to run best on their hind legs, research on the plethora of Edmontosaurus remains raised the possibility of these animals travelling their fastest on all fours. The researchers note that they cannot be sure of the exact way they moved, as the fastest speed was produced by hopping. This seems unlikely for a Thornton dinosaur, showing there are still some kinks to work out in their model. The mummies show massive muscles around the hips. This animal had a big ass, <laughs> Showing that Edmontosaurus could move fast, probably over 30 miles an hour. Iguandon was far slower, reaching a top speed of about 15 miles per hour. Its hands were very well suited to walking, with the tips of digits 2, 3 and 4, that were flattened and curved with keratin to become something like hooves. The bones of the hand were packed tightly together and the wrist was strengthened, all for the purpose of supporting weight. It is notable that while walking the palms would have faced each other in a similar way to the theropods with their clap hands, and very little movement in the wrists. Digit 5 was very flexible and probably had a wide range of movement. The joints were very smooth and shallow, meaning that the limit of movement would have depended more on the muscles than on the joints. It probably was able to press into the palm and could interact with the other fingers. This has led many to see it as a well-adapted grasping finger. The spike, originally thought by Mantel to be a horn, and Owen suspected might have belonged on the foot, was one point of bone connected directly onto the hand with little range of motion. The thumb spike, or polex, of Mantellosaurus is rather puny. Even with a sheath of keratin it would have been little more than a spur. On Iguanodon, however, this spike was 20 centimetres long, probably reaching 30 centimetres with a keratin covering. There were theories about what the thumb was used for, a hook, an opposing digit to the fifth to help in grasping, or as a weapon. This was first seriously proposed by Lydecker, who noted a scratch mark on the shoulder of another Iguandon that he thought might have resulted from a polex, indicating that it was used for fights within the same species. Norman, however, thought that the answer lay in the differences in the size of the spikes between Mantellosaurus and Iguanodon. If the spikes were indeed used for intraspecific fights, like over mates, then they would have been proportionally the same size for the two. There would be no reason for Mantellosaurus to have such a tiny spike. Iguandon was the larger animal, and adults at least would have spent most of their time on all fours, while the smaller Mantellosaurus would have spent more time as a biped, and was probably faster and more agile. When a predator came, Mantellosaurus could run, but Iguanodon would have to stand its ground. The adults were big, with thick limbs, a stiff tail, a heavy body, and a foot-long dagger might have given it that extra edge if needed. Despite some theorising that it might have injected venom, there is no evidence to support that. There is no groove or hole to deliver venom, and no sign anywhere of a venom gland. The predators of the Cretaceous were very different from those of the Jurassic. Allosaurus was gone, and replaced by two new types of Carnosaur, Carcharodontosaurs and the Spinosaurs. Iguandon had to contend with early forms of both. While Mantellosaurus might have been fast on its hind legs, running was not a good long-term strategy. The predators, being Saurissians, had those bird-like air sacs, allowing them to run for long periods without getting winded. Iguandontids had to use their agility to end a chase fast. The longer it went, the further the odds would shift in the hunter's favour. They did have another method of safety though, herding. The Bernisart specimens number about 24 complete or almost complete skeletons, and it's uncertain how many individuals the other remains represent. It is not considered a single mass death event, as it seems there were several death events within a short time, geologically speaking. It is notable that all of the specimens were of young adults or older, but this is far from evidence of age-segregated groups. It is possible that only individuals of a certain size died at this point, or that smaller bodies were carried off by water currents. Body fossils do not tell you much about the age makeup of a group, and footprints proposed as being from Iguandon are not very extensive. There are signs that animals like Iguandon did not migrate. Edmontosaurus, again this is because it's one of the most studied dinosaurs, had a wide range over most of North America. It was thought that it migrated north in the summer and then south during the winter when things got particularly cold. Examination of the tooth wear and chemistry indicate that Edmontosaurus changed its diet throughout the year, and stayed around the same latitude. A yearly change in diet may seem to imply migration, but animals tend to migrate to keep their diet consistent. There is also the evidence of the differences between Edmontosaurus found in northern Alaska and those further south in Alberta. 
the southern animals had more consistent growth, while those in the north had severely limited growth during the winter, implying that they stayed there all year round. Despite there being no evidence of migration, groups of different animals did seem to gather together. Iguanodona and Mantellosaurus are often found close together. This led some to think that they might have been males and females of the same species, but this did not hold up. They probably banded together to form a collectively larger group than either could alone. There are also a few other animals that are often found nearby, but I'll get into those later. There is another piece of evidence against hadrosauriform migrations, and that is how they raise their young. For a good example, I would like to introduce you to Myosaura, the good mother lizard from the late Cretaceous. This is the best example of hadrosauriform nesting. They were found in large nesting colonies, similar to modern seabirds. Myosaura were almost the same size as Iguanodon, and laid 30 to 40 eggs in a spiral pattern, covered in rotting vegetation to keep them warm. The eggs were about the same size as an ostrich's, and they were only 7 metres between nests. For an animal that could grow 9 metres long, this would have been cramped. Baby Myosaura showed poorly developed legs, but well developed and worn teeth. They could not walk for the first year, and may have stayed in the nest until they were two. During this time, they were probably well fed by their parents, bringing either whole food, or food that they had already processed and carried in their crop, again similar to birds. Having a nesting colony keeps a herd rooted to a particular location, even if those not tending to a nest travel for food. A collection of around 50 Myosaura of different ages was uncovered in Montana, such a large collection of a single species offered a rare opportunity for a population analysis. It seems that over 89.9% died in their first year. This fell to 12.7% from their second year, when they were able to move about more freely and be protected in a herd setting. They would reach sexual maturity at 3, where there would be a brief mortality spike, and then it would drop off with no sign of death in the next few years of life. They would reach their full size at about 8, when the mortality would rise again to 44.4%. The yearlings grew fast, when any drop in availability of food would lead to starvation. On the cusp of sexual maturity, it would have been the same issue. Hormone changes would lead to increased food requirements, risking starvation during the tumultuous time of the Cretaceous. Young adults would be inexperienced with the social interactions of mating and could easily become injured by rivals. Predators would go after the young before they could be protected by a herd of adults, and they would target the sick and injured, usually the old. This kind of population dynamic is seen today in red deer on the Scottish Isle of Rum, and something similar was probably happening with Iguandon. Iguandon lived in the late Baremian to early Aptian ages of the early Cretaceous, about 126 to 122 million years ago. They are found in southern England and Belgium, with signs as far as Germany and Romania, and the Galapanensis species early in the Boremian in Iberia. In most of these areas it's found alongside Mantellosaurus, its smaller, more agile cousin. In Spain, Iguandon would have been joined by Magnamanus, almost as large as itself, and the smaller Morelodon. In the Wessex formation there was also Valdosaurus, another small Iguanodont, and the newly described Brystonius. There was a little Hypsilophodon, and signs of a small Hedrodontosaurid. There are often signs of Polacanthus, a nodosaurid protected by armour and spikes, but seeming to appreciate having the ornithopods acting as lookouts. In a pinch, the Polacanthus would also act as a block to predators, keeping alive the old Thyreophore and ornithopod tag team. The bitty evidence that we have of the sauropods leaves things a bit vague. It seems that even though they were on their way out in numbers, they were making it up in variety. There is Eucomeritus, thought to be some kind of brachiosaurid, and there is evidence of a moderate-sized rabacosaurid. Most were some kind of titanosauriform sauropod, between 15 and 20 metres in length. There is also a single neck vertebra that looks similar to a brachiosaurid. If you scale up, you would get a brachiosaurid about 20 metres long, making it Europe's largest dinosaur. It has not been formally described and named, but its nickname is Angloposeidon. For the predators, you had Aristosuchus and Calamosaurus. These would have helped drive the high mortality in baby Iguanodon. You also had the Dromaeosaurine Nithodesmus. This would have used cooperative hunting on Mantellosaurus or a small Iguanodon. There is also a large Velociraptorine tooth. Scaling up, you would get a Velociraptorine about the size of a Utah Raptor. If this was a lone predator, it would have been able to take down young Iguanodon and Mantellosaurus. 
There were signs of things to come in the form of Eotyrannus, one of the earliest Tyrannosauroids. The only one found was not fully grown, and it would have been a menace to Iguanodon. But the Tyrannosaur supremacy was still far off, and the apex predator was Neovenator, a carcharodontosaurid that specialised in finding prey and tearing into them with its razor-sharp teeth and claws. The trauma of an attack would probably kill the prey, even if it took some time. All Neovenator had to do was follow and wait. The waterways around where most of these animals were preserved were teeming with a whole host of animals. The air was filled with insects, some parasitic, some new pollinators, and a variety of pterosaurs. There were many lizards and mammals in the undergrowth, usually only identifiable by their teeth. The waters were filled with fish, turtles, and a lot of sharks. There was also a large variety of crocodilians. Most were small, like Bernisartia, named after where it was found alongside the Bernisartiguanodon. Some reached 4 metres, like Anteopthalmosuchus and Hulcephalus. But towering above them was Baryonyx, an early spinosaurid. Gut contents of one showed that they ate fish and Iguanodon. Whether this was a kill or simply scavenged, we don't know. A large Baryonyx could probably chase off the animal that killed the Iguanodon, or its long sensitive snout might have helped it get morsels that other large carnivores found difficult to reach. Baryonyx would not have been a rare sight. Spinosaur teeth like those of Baryonyx have been found all over southern England and Iberia from this time. In 2021, two new Spinosaurs from the Isle of Wight were described, showing how widespread and diverse these dinosaurs were. The riverbank hunter Raparavenita and the horned crocodile face Ceratosuchops. All of this is at the time of recording and subject to change, with Raparavenita, Ceratosuchops and Bryostonius all being described last year. The Isle of Wight is one of the oldest dinosaur fossil sites, and it is still able to surprise. Iguandon helped birth the study of dinosaurs. It has been with us for nearly 200 years, and while not always on the cutting edge, has been a barometer of how our view of dinosaurs has changed. The recent discoveries show that no matter how long we have studied an ancient animal, the more we find, the less we realise we know. Some may find that disheartening. I find it exciting in what revelations might be around the corner. Thanks for watching. As always, like, subscribe, ring the bell if you want to be updated when I manage to complete another video, and share with anyone you may know who have an interest in dinosaurs or the history of science. Keep up those suggestions in the comments. Mentioning Iguandon seemed to bring a load of Hadrosaur fans out with suggestions for Parasaurolophus, Corinthosaurus, and even Lambiosaurus. Also, I do try to answer any questions that you may have. I hope this will not become a regular thing, but I do have a correction to make regarding my Brachiosaurus video. When I talked about the Portuguese trackway showing seven subadult sauropods walking in the same direction, I showed the wrong Portuguese trackway. This is the trackway that I was talking about. All the information was correct, I just got the wrong image. There are a few sauropod trackways in Portugal. If you're interested in the early history of dinosaurs, I cannot recommend to you enough The Dinosaur Hunters by Deborah Cadbury. I've included an A Books link below, and for more recent books on dinosaurs, or whatever else you're interested in, there's also a link to bookshop.org. I'm not being sponsored, I just like supporting local bookshops who source these sites. Next. By the late Triassic, the dinosaurs had achieved a foothold in the oases of the Pangaean Desert but they needed a pioneer to blaze a trail across the world. A dinosaur profile on Coelophysis. Hope to see you then.